I was a simple farmer. Now I own half of New Hampshire, thanks to CashForSouls.com. Turn your unwanted souls into cold hard cash from CashForSouls.com. Cash to buy that dream house you always wanted, or run for Senate, or a new hat for the missus. All that money can buy, thanks to CashForSouls.com. I had no idea my soul was worth so much. With souls and dreams at their highest value in centuries, CashForSouls.com is able to give you top dollar for your unwanted souls. We cut out the middleman, which means more cash in your pocket. I made a simple wish and I had cash in my pocket the very next day. Just attend one of our exciting seminars at the La Mama Theater in lucrative New York City. Fill the seats with your unwanted, broken, or lost souls. We will take care of the rest. Oh, and bring the young ones, 10 and up. It's a safe, reliable transaction with satisfaction guaranteed. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi. Thank you so much sure. for making some time for us. We're part of a puppetry class at Hunter College. Uh huh. Yeah, I expected uh, two like <laughs> teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> Just how you found yourself who you are today. Um. Okay. I'll give you the short version. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I understand. Uh, I'm third generation in the theater. My grandfather, wow. my father in the Chinese opera, my mother was in the Chinese opera, all my uncles were in the Chinese opera. So it's three generations in the theater. I never wanted to be in the theater. Never. I'm just going to have to Yeah. 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 Well, they immigrated over here. They were performing over here, but you know, it's a limited audience. And uh, they had plenty of kids and relatives dependent on them because of the war, the Second World War, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My father was way too good a man, and he just took care of everybody. So he had to give him, you know, I mean, there wasn't any way that he could have continued being a Chinese opera person once he decided to move west. It just wasn't real. And so anyway, so he settled down, fortunately not in the laundry business, but in the restaurant business. <laughs> so we ate very so well growing up. Yeah. Um, Good benefit. Uh, and uh, my, fa my father's, one of my father's very closest friends was a scenic drop painter for the opera. And who gave me, I always remember, he gave me uh, Grey's Anatomy, which you probably don't know anything about. You're not a visual arts yeah. person because it was kind of a Bible of anatomy. Right, right. He gave me Grey's Anatomy, a book, a beautiful book, which I still have, the one I still have of, that he gave me, of Hiroshige, Hiroshige, I think is the best pronunciation, one of the great Japanese uh, woodblock, woodblock uh, artists. And um, I think those are the two books I remember. There may have been other things, but anyway, so I was seeing his, I was fascinated by the magic of drawing, you know, just that someone could do an image on a piece of paper, and I, uh, so I took an interest in that, and uh, at the same time, went, so I went to High School of Art and Design on 57th Street, um, and at the same time, I was, even before going to high school, I was enamored of the cinema. And really, the cinema is my great love to this day, not theater. Mm -hmm. I'm really not interested in theater. I, 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 my Netflix uh, queue line is 475 films, usually 500 films. So that gives you some idea yeah. of where my love is. Yeah. I don't go to the theater much, I mean, very rarely. Um, but it's not that I don't like theater, it's just that most of it is very boring to me. So, as form, not as content. Content can be strong and all that. But I'm very much, you know, it's, form matters to me a lot. And it's not interesting to me most of it. Um, so I was going to film school, high school. I mean, I was going to art, art, art high school. I was a, fil a film critic. Uh, for the newspaper for a year, I think, or two years, I don't remember anymore. 
I wrote poetry in, in, in school as well. So the arts were definitely, and, and I was the kind of student who was, who took the route of this resistance, which meant what I was interested in was what I was going to study. What I wasn't interested in, I was just going to pass. Mm -hmm. I was not that. I was not an honor student. You know what I mean? I was none of those things. I was definitely single focused kind of person. If I could use the arts to get away with not having to do the other things, I used it. <laughs> Uh, so I graduated Excellent from... Excellent fine management school. Yeah, really. And I, I mean, to this day, I go, I didn't need geometry and no. algebra. I never did had any applicability to what I'm doing. Never. Um, when I graduated from art school, I went to Pratt Institute to study visual arts. I thought I was going to be a painter. Or, and... Uh, High school is the beginning of, of recognizing that I was someone from a culture different than the majority. Because before before going to junior high and going to elementary school, I went to elementary school in Chinatown. If there was one white kid in the class, that was that was mm -hmm. a big thing. Yeah. So there was hardly any white kids. And then when I went to junior high school, I went to Little Italy, which was half Italian, half Chinese. So I grew up with the Italians, and that was about it. Which which I didn't really have any relationship with. I went to school with the kids, these kids, but I didn't have a social life with them. My, I, my, my, I only have one white friend and he was not Italian. He was the one they picked on because he wasn't Italian. <laughs> and he spoke standard American English, which was weird to them. So he was the one who got beat up, but he was the one. And I tend to, to gravitate to the person who was different. That's my, you know, what, what interests me is what's different. So anyway, I, I graduated from art uh, high school and went to Pratt and for two years was very alienated by what art meant in Western ideology. It just, I, just, I just didn't relate to it, didn't understand why I didn't relate to it or any of those things. And the consciousness of being other in America was slowly bubbling up. Then, uh, in my second year of art school, but don't, don't forget this was 66, 66 mm -hmm. I think it was, which was the height of the international film, film um, uh, international cinema. Kurosawa, Sadiajit Ray, Antonioni, Fellini, you know, I mean, it was like yeah. the great international cinema. And um, also, uh, filmmaking was the sexy art at that time and I was naturally interested in film anyway so even when I was at Pratt I tried to make a short film at that time so I went and went to school of visual arts and graduated in filmmaking um, and when I graduated this was 69 I also realized I said well there aren't any Asian or colored filmmakers out there this isn't real and, but it was the 60s, so I was smoking a lot of pot and, and uh, being a slacker because I could afford to be. My father had died, and when I graduated from film school, I learned that I was entitled to money because he had died. I don't remember what that thing was, but so for a couple of years, I didn't have to take life seriously or make a living. You know, I just kind of was having a good time. <laughs> Uh, and, I, and I was, you know, living very cheaply back then. As, I don't know if you're New Yorkers, but, you know, it was super cheap to live in New York back then. Um, so, because I knew that I, I didn't have either the aggressive or egotistical personality to go into film, which you really need to have, because it's such a hard business to get into. One, two, you had to be persistent to the point of being unpleasant to get ahead in mm -hmm. it. And three, I wasn't white. So all of those reasons, I said, well, you know, this is, you know, I don't know what to do. So I decided to take dance classes because I, I uh, was interested. I had been going to see dance. Like I saw, I, I was going to the Broadway theater towards the end of the great Broadway days, you know, seeing the big, you know, Camelot, Ray Boger, you know, all these great old, uh, but, you know, end of the vaudeville 
blind kind of people, and, you know. And at the same time, I was also going to see Merce Cunningham on Broadway, Twyla Tharp on Broadway, you know, uh, Alvin Ailey on Broadway. And I was, I always liked dance, but I, it, was, it wasn't the thing to do for a guy, right? At that time, especially. And I, but then I was like, this was the 60s, and I said, well, I don't know what to do with myself right now. I'm just going to take a class with someone that I've heard about who's a real wild, wild person. And I was interested in her, but I was too lazy to make the effort to go see half the stuff. And so I started to take classes with Meredith Monk at NYU. Uh, in her evening class that she was teaching. And so I started to see what she was doing, which was really fascinating, because I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, you know, she was bringing in pictures and stuff. I hadn't actually... Then I went to see one of her performances at the Whitney Museum. And at the end of the semester, she said, you know, you're, you're a gifted mover. You, you should come to my private class, because it's the end of the NYU session. And I, first of all, I, can, I went, I don't know what she's talking about. I'm a good mover. I have no idea. So I didn't go. And uh, and one day I'm on. I'm, I live. I, I still live in the neighborhood. I live uh, uh, on Bleecker Street, right over here. And one day on Broadway, I run into Meredith, and she said, "Why don't you come to my class?" And I just kind of mumble something, and she said, "Well, there's a class tonight. Come." So that's. If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here now. Oh. And if I hadn't run into her on that corner of Broadway and Houston, I wouldn't be here. So it's just a very fateful encounter. I took that that uh, series of classes. At the end of it, she said, "You want to be in a piece of mine?" <laughs> and I, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and it was fantastic. Uh, and so the first thing I ever did with her was uh, a thing called, it was a really strange long name, it was a, uh, Needle Brain Lloyd and the Systems Kid. And it was done at Connecticut College for the Connecticut College Dance Festival before it moved down to the Carolinas. And it was a performance with over 80 people, horses, motorcycles, a rowboat on a lake, four people painted red, uh, a monster, uh, flares, in one, two, three different locations with a dinner break in the middle. Magic. Midsummer's Night Dream. And, you know, I've never been in anything like it before in my life. Of course, between my coming from the Chinese opera and being with Meredith, I was never going to be doing Eugene O'Neill. <laughs> not to mention, no, I, did not see, I did not see I did not see traditional Western theater uh, until I was seventeen. Up to that point, it was all Chinese opera, or Chinese cinema, or Western cinema, but not, you know, not Western theater. And the first thing I saw was Julius Caesar in high school. I happened to be in a. Uh, it happened to be. An art school that had a very good dance program, an unusually progressive dance program, a really good big band, and a good theater department. It was just, you know, it just happened at that point of time in time at Art Museum. There were wonderful things happening there, you know, very progressive. Um, and uh, so, where were we? Just. Uh, so I, so I did Meredith's that first show, and she then I became a member of the company after that. I had no experience in the theater at all. I didn't know what a cue was, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Were uh, you aware of how, how popular she was at the time? Well, I mean, I, I didn't have any um, perspective. I mean, I was, uh, as a young person trying to find home in the arts in New York, I was, I went to Cafe Chino, I don't know if you know what Cafe Chino is, Cafe Chino is a legendary downtown theater, like La Mama, same time as La Mama started, and Joe Chino was a really important, uh, he had a cafe, um, very gay sensibility in the West Village, uh, Langford Wilson 
did his first works there. I mean, other people yeah. did too. I, I don't know the history of uh, Joe Chino so much, but but it was an important, a very important downtown, historically a very important downtown theater place at the same time as Lamar. And uh, so I was, you know, I was roaming around looking at, I went to the, you know, to see experimental oh cinema, you know, like Andy Warhol's Chelsea Girls mm -hmm. and Stan Brackage. Yeah. So my education was really kind of self-taught and, and yeah, on, on some levels. Mm -hmm. As soon as I met Meredith, soon after, I met, I mean, I, I started working with her in 72 or 71. I made my first solo work in 72. Mm -hmm. Um, so really, they paralleled. Even though I was in in her company, I was also making my own. I started making my own work on a nickel. I mean, the first show cost a hundred dollars. It actually made money, yeah, unlike the shows now <laughs> that I make. Though they don't make money now, but but because it was only a hundred dollars and it actually did go places, I was able to make money. Nobody got paid, you know, and everything was borrowed. It was possible to do. But so. Parallel with working with Meredith from 1972 through 1978, I started my own body of work. I also collaborated with her on some works. Of course, she comes from a dance vocabulary, so that was actually a very big influence in terms of um, the. F I mean, I happen to be a physical person, so my work was at the beginning wasn't physical. For the first ten years, it wasn't physical. It was very visual arts, very static very long time things. You know that visual arts people like slow, long things. <laughs> they don't have a sense of time, theater time, you know. Anyway, so back then all the works were long and slow and not textual at all. You know, very little text, a very visual. And the very first show I made called Lazarus, and the theme in my, themes in my work have largely been about otherness because I was from High school on, I was negotiating a new world I, I wanted to belong to. And by doing that, I became alienated from my own world that I came from and not really fully feeling comfortable in the new world. So it was a very difficult time for me. And my work reflected that, those issues, which I didn't fully understand. You know, But this was also the, when I started working in 72, was the beginning of the Asian American identity movement, which I had no contact with because I was not in Chinatown and I didn't know Chinese or Asian artists. I was just finding my way in the world. Um, so for me, that whole identity thing was something I had to figure out on my own, not with any group of people. And I wasn't really a joiner anyway. I don't really like, you know, group think. Um, so, the first work was Lazarus, called Lazarus, a man who comes right from the dead, who no one can, re he can never, no one can relate to this idea of having been dead and coming back, and, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that was a metaphorical, totally metaphorical of how I was feeling at the time, but the work, the very first work I did, had recorded sound. Back in 72, very few works had recorded yeah. sound. Um, film projection, slide projection, it was very much about space. There was puppetry in it, there was object theater in it. You know, so I was a dis interdisciplinary person right from the start. Interdisciplinary. From your puppetry. Very, from your very first production. Yeah, and puppetry was very much a part of who I, I am. You know, it wasn't something I, I just, it just was part of it. So that's, so that was the beginning. And uh, for the first 10 years, I didn't have a company. I didn't do a lot, even though I was working with Meredith at the same time, and I was dancing it with Meredith, if my work was very static. Partly, that was also partly because I did want to step on her toes of her territory. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of like, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. But at the same time, I was working through my visual arts roots. Um, so they weren't, they weren't, uh, they were very, like I said, very painterly, 
very static, much closer to puppetry in a, in a way, because it has that kind of stillness that puppetry often has. Uh, and for the first 10 years, there were often puppetry elements in, in the work. So the second one, there was a miniature airplane with lights in it, uh, a little, very crude, because at that time I wasn't really thinking that I was doing puppetry at all. It was just, it was just the means I chose to use. There were two miniature birds on strings that flew to bounce on, you know, coiled wires. I mean, very strange things, very hermetic strange things. And then the third piece, Fear and Loathing in Gotham, which was very much about this issue of identity, of being in a white culture and not being white, and what is this relationship? And in Fear and Loathing in Gotham was an, uh, my own take on Fritz Lang's end. There was a little playlet within it about the, the Dutch selling trinkets to buy Manhattan from the, from, uh, the Indians. It's all very much an American story, in a way, too. So that one had masks floating across the stage in an, in an anonymous city. The masks were the faces that were the anonymous city. There were all kinds of objects that were, were in the founding of Manhattan scene. We kept bringing out all this kind of cheap junk uh, to, to make the sense of abundance, you know, of, of American abundance. You know, there was a cartoon in it that I used, which was from which was the Grateful Dead's opening cartoon they always used. Uh, which was kind of a reference to LSD. It was the Sunshine Makers, it's called. So cartoon, and, and also I did animation in school. And animation is a form of puppetry. And I really liked animation, but I, but I neither had the advisor or anyone to tell me, and I was good at it, but no one really told me how I would make a living from it. Or, you know what I mean? I didn't understand. I enjoyed it, but I couldn't see how I was going to be able to use it. So, and, 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 and so that, I never went that way. I suppose I could have if, if someone had helped me go that way. Because um, I was very much alone in this exploration of the journey of becoming an artist. Um, where are we? So the fourth, the third piece, yeah. So that first decade was very much about, um, let's say, evolving my vocabulary. The second decade, which was when I formed my company, was the decade which was the most choreographic decade, where I, I, I finally let myself be the physical um, artist that I wanted to be, not feel I was stepping on anyone's toes. So the second decade was, it was I, I had a company, and it was evolving a vocabulary with the actors that was my vocabulary and my way of working, which was much more physical, much more dance-oriented, as well as physical acting and, and textual work. And I would alternate between highly textual works and works that weren't textual throughout the 80s, and highly uh, media-oriented and low-tech, just, just to constantly, you know, I was always reacting to whatever I just did. And and in the 80s, puppetry was less present, but some form of object theater was present. I mean, yeah, there, there, were, there were objects, little things that you would say were related to puppetry. And then in the 90s, so the first two decades, because of Meredith, I was traveling to Europe with her a lot. So. So I got, I got, so my focus was trying to get to Europe because at that time also all the downtown avant-garde people went to Europe because no one was supporting us over here. We were, we were all trying to go to get to Europe. But that didn't work out for me at the, you know, I mean it did to some extent, but in the end I realized that I was, I was seeing Europe as the, as the criteria of where I needed to go. And, in, and then by the 90s, when I started to reclaim my identity as an Asian American, I said, fuck it, I'm, not, I said, I'm an American artist and that's defined by being American, not by being European American. And you know, so everything shifted there. And the first two decades of work were usually fable-like, allegorical, 
not um, not uh, realistic in any way. And the ninety from ni the nineteen ninety on, the, the work became about what I called poetic documentaries, and they were they were all historical works about history. But if at the same time, I was getting older. You know, you don't you're not interested in history until you're older. So that I think had something to do with it too. And at the, and I and in the nineties. Four major works I did that took me ten years was uh, called the East West Talk Quartet, which was each of each of the pieces was about the West's relationship to a different Asian country. So the first one was Japan and the West, the second was China and the West, which was made just before Hong Kong was returned to China and partially was about that. And then the third one was about Vietnam and the West, and the fourth one was about Korea and the West and Japan. In the 90s, that was a major work for me. At the same time in the 90s, another seminal work for me was the documentary. Uh, so documentary was a very operative word for me in many ways. So was this um, series called Undesirable Elements, which you probably know something about, right? which is a very different than any of my other works. It's uh, six or seven non-actors sitting in a chair with a music stand with the script in front of them doing oral history that's so unlike anything i've done they it was about otherness though because it was always about why they, they were on stage was that they were other so but that thing turned out to be this major epic project of mine that's been going on for 20 years and still going on so, um, it's theater, it's documentary theater in a very different way than anything anyone's done because these are not performers. These are real people. But it works because it's going on for 20 years. Yeah. Over oh. 40 productions nationally, oh, internationally. Yeah, uh, but, but very structured, very sophisticated in the structure of it. Not, you know, not just crude storytelling. It's actually very, very um, manipulated in a way, you know. Um, and then in the in the um, early '90s, uh, I was invited by the uh, what is that called uh, in Atlanta, the Puppetry Center, the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta. One of the uh, John Ludwig, who's the artistic director there, had taken a workshop with me on set design in Holland that I taught and he, he was very, he, know, he knew my work and he took the workshop and he invited me to do a puppet theater work and I wanted to work on Kaidan for a very very long time but I never could quite figure out how to do it and I didn't really feel it was, uh, I wanted to work uh, with uh, actors to tell those stories. And that's how my puppetry, over, you know, my real puppetry work uh, started. And I would have done puppetry work earlier, but I'm not, a, even though I'm, I, I'm a media person and I use a lot of technical things, I'm personally not technical. I'm personally a Luddite. So I can't build things, you know. I can sculpt if I need to, but I don't, I'm not, I can't construct anything, I don't. In Kaidan, what I did in Kaidan was, I came up with this concept of the multiple windows. And Kaidan is like a movie. I mean, you know, the, the scale thing is totally comes out of my cinema background. And it has a soundtrack throughout the whole show. It's totally cinema uh, adapted for a puppet form. So I storyboarded everything. So I, I knew what, 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 although at the same time it was kind of like scary because you had to build all these damn things and if they were scaled wrong, you know, it doesn't work, right? It was kind of a leap of faith, you know, when I, whenever I do these puppet shows, it's really kind of a leap of faith, I mean, about what I decide to do because if it doesn't work, this hard to back out of because this, you know, time is money in, in the arts. So, um, but it worked out, and Kaidan was a huge hit, 
you know. Yeah. So, um, some things technically, uh, John Ludwig came up with some solutions. I said, I want this to happen, but I don't know how to make it happen. Give like one example. Well, the 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 scene, the first story where there's where the priest is in the room with the dead, the corpse, and then the corpse just gets sucked into the bed. That was, uh, and we needed the ghost. How we was we going to show the ghost the ectoplasma coming into the room? That was John Ludwig's uh, solution: was to use this kind of mirror with a light on it, and it would just reflect up and move along. Oh, very I mean, he's very ingenious. I mean, John's very ingenious, you know. So the cons the perspectives in each thing and the scale things were mine. First of all, the the soundtracks pre-recorded. The speaking parts are all pre-recorded because they're moving around backstage. There's no way to be to to for them to do that with microphones because you hear everything creaking right. and stuff. So everything is pre-recorded. So they have the pre-recorded thing to work with, and then uh, it's so, it's somewhere between improvisation and setting it at the same time because I'm watching them improvising and then I say no, don't do that, do this, or, you know, like that. But they're also, in this form of puppetry, uh, the depth, of playing depth is very shallow because if you, because if you go too far back, parts of the audience can't see. It's very, very hard because you can't go far back. Although in Kaidan we did go far back because we opened all three windows and, we, and the set actually moved forward. You know, so all three windows are open so the center people always get to see everything but the people on the side don't so if you have everything open you can't yeah. but if you only have this window open you right. can't go far right you go back they can't see it right. neither right. side can see it so there, there, there are conditions that they know they have to work within and then it's just working out the gestures and things like that within a scene and, and some of that is live you know where, where we input we're improvising live during during the rehearsals yeah. And for cafe, a red is over 150 puppets. Yeah. How do you manage that many performance objects? How do you? Uh, well, let's talk about yeah. the the. First of all, this these puppets, these guys. There was a whole series of them, and they're all on one or two triggers, so they have limited things movements they can make. But they're actually managed by one or two people. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's one example. In the shadow puppetry thing, sometimes the puppets are again connected in some way. Uh, the first story, this first story. Well, and, and the other reason that there's so many puppets is because of the scale. So that there's not just one version of Lady Yang, there's multiple versions of Lady Yang at different sizes. So that's why there's there's not many puppets. Yeah. And these were highly, highly expensive shows. I mean, Cafe was a quarter of million dollars. I don't get to do that very often. You know, I mean, I was lucky to have three, three shows like this, which were incredibly expensive. Uh, I, I don't have that opportunity now, today, to do this. And Cathay was produced by the Kennedy Center. And the Kennedy Center had a lot of money. And uh, we had done Obon at, uh, we had done Obon at Seattle Rep. Seattle Rep had heard about Kaidan, wanted Kaidan. And we said, well, why don't we do a new, show, new puppet show? And they went, good idea. So we did Obon, uh, Obon which was sold out there. Um, and uh, so, and Obon, and all of the projects were collaboration with, uh, funding-wise, with uh, Japan Foundation. And our, at that time, we had an agent in Japan, and he, he also, you know, said, if we can make this a collaboration with Japanese puppeteers when you bring the show over, we can get funding for oh, yeah. it. So, you know, there were all kinds of, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you do whatever you need to do to get the money. That's, yes. what, that's what, you know, in whichever way you can. You know, today people would probably do Indiegogo now. Yes. <laughs> we have used Indiegogo and it has worked very effectively. So, but anyway, that's Bruce's 
job, not mine. You know. Right. Um, and we had uh, the Undesirable Elements documentary project. That wasn't the first show I did in Japan, but that show had an impact in Japan when we did it. And so we were noticed by the Japanese muckamuck, whatever they, whoever they were, whatever they were. And we were lucky enough when we did the original Undesirable Elements in New York, in its birth, there was a young uh, arts administrator, Columbia, Japanese Columbia art administrator student who was there and was really impressed with it and is now, you know, a big muck and muck in the Japanese art theater administration world. And he brought Undesirable Elements over, which won a prize in Japan. And so that helps, helped us open the doors to Japanese funding. And since the subject was Japanese, you know, it, it was possible to do it with it. Kaidan is, you know, it's, it's like Cinderella. I mean, everybody knows these stories. So that's how that happened. Um, and then Cathay was, you know, uh, Kennedy Center. So we had already been at the Seattle Rep. And then we went back to them and said, you know, we got all this money for the Kennedy Center. Would you build a show and be sort of cool? It was a good deal. It was, you know, we, we were doing Kennedy Center. We were doing, what were we doing with that? Uh, New Victory and uh, Seattle Rep. So it was, you know, it was uh, big organizations, you know. So and the Jap and the Chinese came over. They didn't bring too much in the way of money, but uh, but we built these puppets. Not all the puppets were built in China, but most of the puppets for this story were all built in China, which means that was a nickel. It really excites you now. It really excites me now. Besides, <laughs> um, if a subject comes up that excites you, that carries you, but it's not like I have a ten-year plan or anything like yeah. that. And and uh, and I don't. I try not to do projects that don't interest me. Mm -hmm. um, and so usually I'll try. You know, usually I'm working on something that's of interest. To me. Um, but but there's no grand scheme, you know. Right now I'm working on a, a big, uh, I'm writing a play, a big play on the Civil War, the American Civil War. So that's, that's been very challenging, very difficult, very challenging. I, I hope I can finish it. Um, I'm working on another piece uh, that kind of goes back to my earlier roots in a way, in that it's much more experimental. Uh, and I'm trying to uh, do uh, a new puppet work, but I don't have any idea what it is. Um, I'm, I'm trying to do a an evening with two other puppet artists. Yeah, we've we've, I've only identified yeah, one, Dan Merlin, whom I know, who worked with me and, and was in my work in my early days. I said, Dan, I said, you know, I, said uh, I told Dan, I said, I'd like to see if we can get an evening with three puppeteers, three puppet artists, uh, to do an evening with a common theme or concept and uh, share an evening. Because I can't afford these shows anymore. Mm -hmm. Not unless, not until the next time somebody gives me the money to do it. So, uh, so those are the things right now. I mean, there's some things I'm kind of interested in, um, and and a lot of my work now, uh, which I'm very committed to, is the social justice work and the documentary work. So I'm very, I would like to really do something on human trafficking with survivors of human trafficking. So that's an area that I'm very committed to, continue to be very committed to. Uh, my name is Ping Chong, and uh, I'm Artistic Director of Ping Chong Academy. This isn't your precious Mizrahi compromise, Mr. Webster. Look at the clause right here. Mr. Stone has clearly agreed to sell his very soul to Satan. That would be me. I think you are referring to the Missouri Compromise, but I'll take a look. It says Mizrahi. 
I do not understand the meaning of that, nor do I understand this Santa Claus. Santa Claus? In seven years' time, Mr. Javis Stone will relinquish his soul to Santa. That is obviously a typo. Who does your typing, Scratch? Jabez Stone. When he isn't farming, he does all of my stuff. Oh, I hate to defend such an abysmal typist. But you understand the principle of the thing, right? No, I really don't. No. I don't. Well, happy holidays anyway. Ah, uh, I don't think so. <laughs>